unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, gotcha. uh, the Consolation Prize. We don't talk about that so much anymore uh, because we raise our kids with uh, participation awards. Everybody gets, uh, and it's been, you know, since my kids were they're little. They, everybody gets a trophy. Uh, at least to the first, uh, I don't know, I think it changes a little bit when you get into high school anyway. Because then they have, they, they begin the adult model of, of uh, consolation prizes. Because they, in team sports, they actually have, start this concept of, of tournaments. And uh, you get down to the final four and the semifinal games, and two win, and two lose. Well, we can't just let the number third and fourth place just ride. They have to play it off as to who gets third and who gets fourth. And then the first two, they play for the championship. There's a first prize, and uh, almost maybe. Maybe next year. Consolation prize. Well, it's. I mean, we can really make those consolation prizes very nice. You spend your whole life, or a major part of it, or at least before the Olympics, almost all of your time, uh, getting ready to compete in the Olympics. And normally speaking, unless it's a team sport, normally speaking, there's only one gold medal, win medal winner, unless you're on a team sport. And, and one, uh, in, in, in the slight event that there might be a tie. But boy, with our, <laughs> with our technology today, uh, and it's amazing how much is, is within hundreds of a second in the race. And, and it can be very, very close. And the prize is a gold medal. The consolation prizes are for the next two people and they get a silver or a bronze. Is that any consolation? No, I didn't get that. You can see it on their faces when they stand up on the podium and they just, you know, some consolation this thing is, I wanted to go. Well, that's what life is about. Not everybody wins. In, in the old Greek games, in the early Olympics, they competed for one wreath made out of <laughs> What, olive, uh, twine, twig together. I mean, that was, and one guy got it. That was it. Just one guy out of the whole athletic group. That was it. I don't think there were any consolation prizes, other than the fact that you got to run around the stadium naked and everybody thought that was a good thing to do. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Just, you cut that out. <laughs> uh, consolation prizes. A lot of, you know, we need consol consolation. We need to be consoled. We need sympathy. We need to, well, you know, <laughs> with the D.C. teams is maybe next year. <laughs> maybe next year they'll, they'll not only get to the playoffs, they might win some. And it's, it, it's, it's always a maybe next year. We don't know. It's a challenge. Consolation. To be cons sometimes it is so bad. We even talked about somebody being unconsolable. It just is so bad off. They cannot be brightened up. They cannot. They're so depressed. They're so. It's a, well. Okay. It, the word consolation is used several places, but in the prayer for the day, the colic for the day, it's for His holy. Consolation. That's one of the parts that talks about the Holy Spirit, which is our topic today. The Holy Spirit. He is the, his consolation. He gives us consolation because life is tough. Everybody doesn't get participation trophies through life. You get fired if you don't do what your job requires to you when you go out and get a job. You grow up in athletic skills. If you are not amongst the top 
percentage on your team, you don't get to be the first team. And you better be better than anybody else on the team if you want to get picked to go to college. And if you want to play professional whatever, you better be better than thousands of other people who are also applying for the same job. And there's no consolation if you fail. You didn't get picked in any round of the draft. There's no consolation. There's no consolation. The Holy Spirit, that's one of his names. The consoler, the counselor. Did you read through all the things in, in Luther's cry? It, it lists that, the Holy Spirit and, and, and uh, call it the come Holy Ghost, God and Lord. Come Holy Light, come Holy Fire, comfort true. Uh, guide divine, God and Lord. Oh, it, it, yeah. the, the Greek word, not that I'm any expert to this, but I read the commentaries and they bring this thing out. The Greek word is paraclete. And it's an interesting word. It's very similar to other kind of things. Paraclete. Uh, para, para meaning aside. And uh, you, you know the derivation of, of the, the kaleo, the call. We're called to be aside the Holy Spirit. He calls us to be with him, to be helped by him, to be a part of him as he is a part of us. That's what Jesus said. I believe in me, I am in you, and you are in me. As I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. It's, it's all that complicated stuff about what's going on. But basically, the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He is the one who is beside us, or with us. I heard the illustration this morning on the Luther Hour program from uh, last week's service that uh, uh, it's like riding a, uh, a tandem bicycle. And, and our usual way when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's uh, we're, on the, we're in the front seat and uh, we got pedals and we have uh, the, the, the handlebars. And we go where we want to go, basically. And we're, we're doing good. And as far as our reliance upon the Holy Spirit, well, that's when, well, when we have the hills up and down. And uh, when we're going up, uh, it's okay now. You can, you can add a little bit more push to it there. You know, are you pedaling now? And uh, it says, oh, I lost track. Were we supposed to turn right or left up here? Oh, okay. It, it's, it's, but we're in control. Well, the speaker of the Lutheran hour said that not until he realized that that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. He comes to be in the front seat. And he guides. And he directs. And we do the best we can to keep up. And on a tandem bike, that's not too bad. But see, in, in, in real life, the Holy Spirit might be leading us a little faster than we think we're ready to go. On a tandem bike, you're stuck unless you're going to jump off, which is possible. And some people do that in regards to the Holy Spirit. But he says, yeah. the Holy Spirit says, okay, let's go. Let's go. Every day. We said that every day, God has something for you as a Christian, something for you as one prophesying his word, declaring his word by your actions, by your speech, by your attitudes about everything that's facing you in life. The Holy Spirit is there to help you, but God has something for you to do every single day. He has in God's wisdom and in God's planning things out and put it, he has, you know, I, and, I, and we fail him every day. We fail him every day. Why? Because we're sinners. We want to be in the driver's seat. We want to control. But when by God's grace and power, we let the Holy Spirit guide our day. He uses us because without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing, as we talk about, to please God. We can't do anything to earn our salvation, to pay for the sins that we have committed, 
for all. I mean, this is one of the great things about our service is that we open up with a confession that we have failed to do what God has asked us to do and we have done stuff he told us not to do. We have failed to show love to God and to our neighbor. And the great part about our service is as God's representative, as in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ, I give you forgiveness of sins. You don't have to do anything else. Just recognize that you're a sinner and you need forgiveness and it comes through Jesus Christ and as his prophet here in this place, I tell you your sins are forgiven. What great news. Because what it does is that every single day we start out not fearing the judge in heaven and that he will condemn us because of our failures of yesterday. But he says, I have paid for all of your sins. That's why I sent my only begotten son into the world. For both his humiliation and his exaltation. As he came to die for your sins and all humanity's sins. So that I can give you in a just way because justice demands your death eternal. And he took your death upon himself. And because he's God, it's more than enough to cover everything. It's covered. He did that. And then God says, baptism. That's why we baptize our children. Parents know our kids need help from the very beginning. Because for some reason, they ain't as perfect as I'd like for them to be. They don't listen to me. They don't do what I tell them even though it's dangerous for them to do something else. They get into trouble and they rebel against me. Parents with kids, every time your child gives you what they're going to give you, every time as an employer, your employees give you what for in a childish manner. Take a serious look at yourself. Do you give those in authority over you the same kind of hassle, the same kind of laziness, the same kind of disagreement without explaining, without discussing it? Do you just rebel? When you realize how sinful you really are, it helps you not only to recognize that God is doing something really special for you to forgive you your sins, but that's why in the Lord's Prayer we say, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It says, if I don't forgive them, don't forgive me. Forgiveness is there. Whether you take it, whether you accept it, whether you don't, forgiveness is there. It's done. It's paid for. It's available to everybody. But what it says is, as you realize how much God has forgiven you, it makes it a whole lot easier to forgive others, even those rebellious children of ours. And if you have been blessed with a mind that still works and remembers your youth and your rebellions, not that we tell the kids until they're grown up, because they create enough of their own. But it's, I have been a sinner all my life. But in holy baptism, which I didn't get until I was 10 years old, but the God was working with me through his Holy Spirit all along those first 10 years. I had parents who were concerned about what God said, and they helped guide me. And, and as I baptized into the Lutheran Church at age 10, I only had a couple of years before I confirmed my own baptismal vow. And in those three years, I learned a great deal about what it means. But the Holy Spirit, the, the scriptures say that in baptism, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment on the eternal life, which is now ours. 
your down payment to the bank that says, I'm going to pay for this, and then you get to live in the house. It's a concept. Well, God, we're living in God's house. We're living in the promise that we're of hope of eternal life with him. Because this life is a mess. It is a mess. It's a challenge. And, and, and with the number of years that I have been so blessed to have experienced them in, I think it's getting worse. And, and because you, get, you can see a bigger picture and you see trends and you see all things. And I pray for my grandchildren and their children because, but see the Holy Spirit, he knows how it's going. And God said it's going to continue until it really gets bad. Until it really gets bad. And then he will make all things new again. But until then, we got to live with it. Because that's our only choice. And why? Because the way that we react, the way that we deal with life, is a witness to other people. It's showing them that we don't have to take revenge. We leave that up to God. He does a whole lot better job anyway at getting revenge at people that cause us trouble. Because if they don't see the light of Christ in this time in life, then they're going to spend eternity in the darkness of hell. And if we make life as miserable for them as they have made it for us, then they're not, we're not going to be able to witness to them that we recognize God's love for us because when we know how much God has forgiven us, it helps us to love other people. That's why he says forgive other people. It doesn't mean that they're going to get forgiveness because they still have to recognize that they're a sinner that need forgiveness and it comes through Jesus Christ. And if they don't admit their sin and ask for forgiveness, but see, that's, that's just, just personal reconciliation. That's always a problem. We are so, I think, I think the present uh, social network term is we're such snowflakes. We're offended by anything that disagrees with what I think is reality. With that much offense, it makes it very, very hard for us to live together. There's no oneness. Koinonia is the word. Fellowship. The fellowship gets split, divided. There's another, we talked about paraclete, which is called a side by the Holy Spirit. The other word, the early word for church was ecclesia. Same root word, call, but ek meaning out, called out of the world to join together in fellowship, koinonia, to be, a, that's the word communion, to be joined together in a, in a single unity of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We joined together and, and Ecclesia called out of the world to go back into the world with the gospel. We become the prophets of today, the preachers, the teachers, the prophesying. That's what I was talking about. And what's the purpose, pur purpose of prophesying? Too many. The purpose of prophesying. Being called out of the world to be renewed by word and sacrament as God's children. And then, because it's as hopeless for us in our humanity as it is, as it was for Ezekiel in, in that great chapter 37 of, of his, his book. And, and the book of Ezekiel, he talked, the, the Valley of the Dry Bones. I mean, some of you are old enough to remember that old girl song, that bones and bones and dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. We as humanity, you know, a lot of pastors sitting there look at, mm, he's snapping, he's taking about, well, I better climb this off because everybody's passing out. It's not like Ezekiel when God said, can these bones live? And he said, oh, you know, Lord, I have no idea. And he says, preach to them the word of the Lord. Preach to them what I tell you to preach. Preach. And he did. And these dry bones, see, that's what, the, forever, that was their custom to, to, pretty much to this day. See, when somebody dies, uh, they bury them right that same day, and then it takes a however long it takes it for all everything but the bones. Uh, the bones is the only thing left, and everything else deteriorate. 
And then they take the bones and put them in a bone box. And then they put all the bone boxes together someplace or other. And, and, and that's, you know, because they've been living there for thousands of years. And, and like what we're having trouble with now is that we don't have enough land to bury everybody, beginning with the, with the national cemeteries for, the, for our military. You know, and, and it's bone boxes, so they, it, bones they get rid of. And, and as he stands, a whole valley of bones, and it all begins to come together and forms an army. Because by our acquired sinful nature, we are no better off than dry bones. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. What were the five things? He calls. Calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies. He calls by the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, gathers me amongst to other Christians, and keeps me in the one true faith. He's the one that makes us holy. That's his name. Sanctus. That's his name. It's holy Spirit. He makes us holy. The Holy Spirit does that and works that in us. And, and, and that's his job. And, and to let him, to submit to him, is difficult for us because we get in the way. We're selfish. We want to get our, our says done. This is, go for it. He said, the consolation through all the trials, tribulations, testings, struggles, you know, nature. Nature's in chaos. Hawaii's just in great threat. They know that there are. There are other places that are about that close to doing the same thing, and we're living with that all the time. Oh, California, <laughs> San Andreas Fault. All that. Yeah. We live in the midst of chaos all the time. Yeah. How many times you know, wrecks on the, on the, on the speedways, <laughs> wrecks on the highways, wrecks on you know, disease, all that kind of stuff's coming. Why? Because the prince of this world, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name you want to call him by, the lying deceiver, is in control. Because of sin, all creation is suffering under it. Christ has conquered him. His time is limited. And when time is up, God will make, not until then, God will make all things new again. Where, how, what? The Bible doesn't explain it. He just says, that's the way it is. God loves you. God wants you to have your sins forgiven. He's paid for it. He wants to give it to you. You can't do anything about it. He said, just submit to the devil. Ta is our natural way of doing it. To the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. But submit to the Holy Spirit. Same kind of thing we talk about marriages. Submit to one another as unto Christ. That way it makes marriages work till death do you part. That's what the Holy Spirit in our koinonia as a church, the body of Christ. There are, there are always attempts, but we can't agree on what the Bible says. Because we let other things be as important or more important than what the Bible says. And so we're not on earth one body in Christ. But we are multiple avenues of access if we use the scriptures because that's how it works the word and the sacraments is how God works through it today these young people I won't make a judgment as to whether they've <clears throat> participated in Holy Communion but I think they have a whole lot better idea now as to what Holy Communion means they are now going to in a few moments confirm the baptismal vows that either they made as younger people or as infants were made for them as they have begun to hear and to understand a little bit better as to the power of the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and keeps us in the one true faith. The Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, the helper, the light. That, and because the purpose of all that preaching and for Ezekiel, the final verses, for the people on that first Pentecost Sunday, that you may know God and know his love and his forgiveness through Christ Jesus. And we know that's all true because, hallelujah, Christ is risen.